and welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew, a once a month podcast about PR and marketing. But this week we're going to be talking about content creation and AI, the thing that every marketer and everybody on the internet is talking about, chat GPT and all the other fun stuff that goes with it. There's a lot of stuff out there, but with me is Devo and he is a content creator, also a fellow podcaster. And I did interview him on a previous podcast called PR360. It's just good to have him back on my show. So welcome to the show, Devo. I'm glad to be back, Brett. Thank you for having me back on uh, and under a new uh, under new umbrella. That's right. And the first question is all my guests is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? I am a adaptogenic. I guess that would be more of a tea than a coffee. I gave up coffee full time. I've been off of it now for a year and a half. All nice. caffeine, How's it going? actually. Oh, I think it's marvelous. I um, I don't know that I would ever go back. I do I do miss coffee because I was sort of a coffee connoisseur snob, when, and I travel around the the world a lot. And then so one of my things was bringing back the local coffees that went whenever wherever. And uh, so I do miss that aspect of it. But what I'm doing now feels has made me much healthier, and I I, I feel pretty good about it. Nice. I mean. I always say be both. <laughs> That's my thing, but <laughs> whatever works for everybody is always good with me too. Congratulations on your new gig, getting this thing up going solo. Yeah, it's uh, it's a long time coming. And I also miss interviewing people. That was another thing. I was like, I miss doing this. <laughs> well, welcome to entrepreneurial life. You can do it um, your rules your way from here on out now. That's true. But I gave a brief introduction to your expertise. Can you give our listeners a little bit more about what you do? What do I do? That's funny because I was just talking to my social media manager last night. We're going we're gonna to come up with a new social media strategy because I'm doing so many things. I don't mean that vainly. I'm just – I'm all over the place. Um, I own a couple of different businesses, podcast, as you referenced, traveling, um, working on some other new ventures on the side that I'm not going to release too much, but uh, have a couple of uh, products that I'm getting ready to launch. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that. Um, but primarily I own fusion photography, which is a traditional photography studio based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I also launched in 2018, a new brand called fusion creative, which uh, focuses exclusively on brand messaging and helping small businesses and entrepreneurs be very clear and succinct on their brand messaging, which is, um, very, it's like the critical piece of, of a small business owner of any business really. It's like, how do you associate a product with a brand and it's through their brand messaging. And so we help them clarify that and then create content around that and then manage all of their digital channels, which is website, social media, advertising, anything that they would use content for branding strategy to help them get their message to a broader audience. Gotcha. And then we're, that's what we're going to be d- kind of diving into is content creation and AI, but how is it going? How, what are your thoughts on AI gaining more awareness in this space and your, your feelings on content creation and AI? Well, it's a rapidly filled, um, rapidly growing field that is evolving by the nanosecond, literally. Um, I think that it has the potential to, to revolutionize many aspects of our lives from, you know, healthcare to transportation, to improving efficiencies, to increasing our productivities, um, enhancing decision-making capabilities even. But I do think as with any emerging technology, there are some risks and some challenges, um, including some ethical concerns that we probably have to pay attention to around biases and privacy and job displacement. Um, there are some catastrophic, catastrophic consequences that if this isn't managed properly by the users and by the developers, um, it could become a widespread issue. And, you know, I mean, we've all seen the, the movies around AI, Terminator, et cetera. Um, I mean, that, <laughs> it, it is an intriguing idea to consider that there is very much, I don't know if you saw recently, there was an interview on 60 Minutes with the, um, the female AI bot. Did you see this? No, I didn't actually see that. Oh, check it out. 60 Minutes just did a full episode on 60 Minutes of, of their you know Sunday night show interviewing an AI um, female robot. <laughs> it's pretty pretty insane, actually, to be honest with it's you. It's a little so, creepy. Um, yeah, it was pretty pretty cool episode. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I've been playing with it for the last six months or so, just really trying to wrap my head around that very question. How can it be used conscientiously and morally without disrupting, you know, the, 
disrupting too much the status quo of who we are uh, of the human element. And so I do have some opinions about it, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll wait until the next question. Mm. So how, how is this going to change? Because I mean, you've used it. I've used it a little bit through just doing show notes and helping me just do like time codes and like things that I don't rather not do, but I need to actually do them at the same time. And then also with like, I've seen some AI stuff just chopping up through premiere, chopping up interviews and chopping them up perfectly where you almost don't have to edit anymore. So how do you, how do you think this will change content creation? Well, I I think that there are, there are a lot of benefits from it from the standpoint of, of the tedious or complex tasks that just take up a lot of time, the minutia of our day-to-day businesses, you know, there is a, Pod Squeeze is one of them that I've played around with uh, for my podcast, and it generates with about seventy-five to eighty-five percent accuracy, and that's an anecdotal number. Um, the show notes, the timestamps, et cetera, and it generates a bunch of other information for me. And um, my 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 relationship with that is to sort of take a look at it and then go through it. And instead of, it's almost like doing a soft edit, you know, back, back in the days when we had had to write essays in high school and college and stuff, right. And we'd write the first draft and then we'd give it to somebody to look over. Right. I don't know if, if you had to go through that space, but um, for me, I see it as more of like a soft edit, a sort of a preview of what I would, what, what I would ultimately post on my own, but I still have to go through and do the manual checks and just make sure that things are, are okay. Um, that it's not disrupting a lot of the data. Um, it's not changing, you know, the scope or the intention of, of a phrase, et cetera. Um, but it's allowed, it's allowed me to really kind of automate some of the tedium that I do in my day-to-day business. Um, and, and consequently, um, improve some of my efficiency and my productivity. Um, I wouldn't necessarily my decision making capabilities because I don't really use it in that sort of um, algorithm, but um, I, I do see a benefit from it in terms of being able to streamline a lot of the minutia that goes on on a day to day basis in my office. So are we going to see like less people knowing how to actually like edit v- photos, edit videos, and edit audios because we have like tools like Descript where you can just look at the words and then cut out the words and then you don't actually have to go through the manual of looking at like the audio waves and looking at how to like cut different things and make it more, I guess, better the video. Are we going to see more of that just because AI is becoming like this, just this like, Hey, you can do everything faster with AI type of a thing. Well, I suspect it's probably the nature of the beast. I mean, with any with any new tool that that's brought or any new curriculum or any new insights or any new technology, there's always going to be sort of a a manual degradation of some sorts, right? You know, like I was talking to uh, to my partner's son last night and we were talking I, I, apparently I hold my pen the same way he does cuz he called it out at the restaurant. He's like, "Hey, you hold your pen the same way I do." And I I just thought it was an interesting observation. And so off the cuff I said, "Do you know how to do cursive?" like you know, he didn't even know what cursive writing was. So interestingly enough, you know, like with anything, there's going to be a degradation of some sort of skill sets, but there's with the loss of anything, there's typically the gain on the other side. So, you know, we might, we are definitely going to lose some of the critical thinking attributes, but I think that's not, I don't believe that's an umbrella statement across for everyone. I think just like cursive writing for him, because I know how to do cursive writing. My kids know how to do cursive writing because I made sure that they knew how to do that because there's a whole bunch of different reasons why. I won't go into that. But I would suspect that a large – a percentage of the population will suffer um, by overutilization of AI. And, and, and the compensation of that is that they'll pick up new skill sets that they hadn't had before, but they're going to lose some, some of the stuff that they've been using up until this point. So yeah, I believe there is going to be a loss in in some way, shape or form. It's inevitable. It's almost unavoidable. I mean, even going with like the ethical side of it, I mean, I've seen Photoshop now have generative AI where it kind of like completes the photo, but it could be complete the photo where you make somebody look bad or videos that could, I mean, deep fakes have been, I ran a little bit longer and they've gotten a little too good for, for my liking where it's like you could make somebody or put someone's face on somebody else and say like, look, you did something bad. So how do we like balance the ethical side of it where it could be funny, but let's not make it look like we're people that did something, didn't do something illegal look like they actually did something illegal or anything like that. Yeah. I'm not sure how you can manage it holistically. I think that there's going to have to be some discretionary 
decisions that are made on a personal level, um, at some point there probably might have to be some standards put in place. Like I saw that Hollywood is now ma- mandating by the year 2024 that you know certain numbers of all movies have to meet a certain criteria of of ethical standards of you know the types of people that are showing in the movies and inclusive inclusivity around that. So there there might have to be some standards put in place around AI if if they haven't taken over by then. Um, but I think more than anything else, that's going to ha- have to become a discretionary decision right now on a on a user by user basis. But I mean, let's not let's not be fooled. Like inauthentic photography and video has been around for a long time. I mean, nobody, none of the actors or actresses you see in movies actually look like that. I don't know if you've ever seen any of them in, in real person, but you know, they're made up and their faces are made over and their bodies are usually sometimes body doubles. Like, so this sort of, this sort of, I don't know if you want to call it fakery, but this sort of inauthentic viewpoint of who we are so that we cosmetically enhanced versions of us has been around for a while now. So whether you do AI or filters or, you know, changing who you actually look like on social media. And, and I, I can tell you, cause I speak for this in person, you know, I, I work with a lot of influencers and the images that people put on their social media are not what they look like in reality. So they're a derivation of that. So um, it's been around for a while. I, I do think that at some point it, it will get out of hand and, and somebody or something is going to have to put some sort of a standard in place. But right now on, it's going to have to be on an individual basis because no one's even taking a look at that in any way, shape or form. Mm. I mean, that is true. I think I had a friend that was doing like professional movies and they would sculpt and do different things. Take out, I think like a woman was pregnant and they took out like the way she looked like. And so she looked, didn't look like she was pregnant anymore type of a thing. And that was basically like making her not what she was at the moment, but (laughs) making it look like she was fit and everything and not actually like six, seven months pregnant. So I, I actually had to put some policies in place around my production process because um, early on, I was getting some sort of ridiculous requests that was bastardizing the actual image and what it was, sort of similar to what you just said, cosmetically enhancing me, making me you know, 20 pounds lighter, removing things, changing this. And I sort of had to put a line in the sand and said, these are not the things that I'm going to do with my images. It's, it's morally – for me, it's a, it's, I have a moral obligation to sort of create, create what I see – and that doesn't mean that I'll, I'm not going to make tweaks to it. You know, if you've got pimples, if you've got things that need to be removed, I'll clean up some wrinkles. Like I'll do, I'll do small minor defects, but I'm never going to manipulate a photo for you. And I tell this to my clients, it's in my contract. There will be no photo or video manipulation. Like I'm going to make you look really good, but that's going to be on me on the outset of how I take the photograph and the lighting that I use and the composition that I use and the angles that I use. But I'm not going to go in after the fact and completely change you from what you look like today. So you're a completely different person. So, um, it has been around for a while and I've gotten some crazy requests to do some absolutely crazy thing. I had someone call me the other day. We did a huge group photo for them and about 20 or so of the hundred people didn't have their arms crossed in a photo. And she wanted to know if I could make everybody have arms crossed. And I was like, I'm just not going to do that. And, and just, I'm just not going to go in and do that. So um, anyway, yeah, I guess that answered the question in a roundabout way. That's a lot of hours just trying to get everybody's <laughs> arms crossed because I mean, you have to make it look like their arms are crossed and, that's a pain in the butt just in general yeah. just doing it manually. Cause you have to make it look, you have to sell it. And if it's not absolutely. sold, then people are like, that's fake. Well, well the, 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 you're absolutely spot on on that. But what's crazy to me is the fact that the question was asked because it's become normal to change the images. It's become normal to add on filters. It's, it's been normalized to put photos in a situational context so other people can see them that aren't actually real. They're fabrications of the original context. And so, you know, those sort of questions are not something I would have gotten 10 years ago. And now I get them today. It's like, can you put me here so that I'm sitting on a beach as opposed to sitting right here? And I was like, is that really what you want me to do? Like, does that, does that really matter in the scheme of things? So, Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, are we going to see less humans actually doing that stuff and more AI as AI is getting more prevalent? I mean, I've seen on Twitter AI create commercials that look very weird, but still look pretty lifelike to be like that could once AI figures out how to do actually do a good commercial that could eventually happen. So are we going to start seeing more of that more AI generated and less human generated type of content? 
I believe so. Yes, I, I, I do. I do believe so. I think it's already happening in a lot of ways. I mean, we've already seen um, some of the video production that AI is putting out. I, I think there's still going to have to be a human. Let me rephrase this. I think you're going to have to make a moral decision as a producer, as a content creator, whether you're in Hollywood or you're on, on a, you know, a small business like I am. At what level are you going to allow this to take over and pervade your life and become the holistic process of everything? And and I've I've made a decision, me personally, that I I, I don't have a problem using it for the minutia. But I do have a problem with it being the final product in every sense of the word. And so while I use it to, you know, pretty create some show notes, perhaps, or I might use it to um, chat GBT to sort of have a conversation, if you will, on some ideas around what could my strategy look like for my social media next month and being able to use it to come up with ideation and sort of take that from there and then expound upon it. Um, that that's That's the decision I've made. But I definitely, in answer to your question, I, I definitely think that there is going to be a large majority of the population because that's just the nature of humanity to try to fish, make things more efficient, more optimal, and to not be involved in the process. Like we're always looking for the quick fix. Like what can we get done right now? So, um, you know, that's part of the problem. This is a much deeper esoteric conversation, but that's part of the problem why we're in the situation that we are is because people don't enjoy the process. People don't get involved in the process. They just want to immediately get to the end. I just immediately want that that I just immediately want that prize on the other side of this. And nobody wants to get into the middle of the muck and the dirt and the filth and get dirty and grimy and, and blood and sweat and tears anymore because you know, we can. We can get to the other side very quickly. So yeah. I, I definitely agree with that statement. Yeah, I mean, I'm more in, a, in agreement with you. I will use AI to help me offset things that I may not want to do, but it will help me automate my workflow. Or if I need to touch up some video, maybe save some videos degraded, I'll use AI to help like uplift it because that's an easier process for that it to do than for me spending too many hours trying to uplift the video. But it. Is, is it, are we going to get to a point where it's just, we may, I mean, I've seen a thoughts on news thing a couple months ago where like one of the middle Eastern countries was doing like an AI news reporter. So it wasn't even a real human anymore. It was all AI generated and they were delivering the news. Are we going to get to that weird spot where even maybe the newscasters aren't actually real anymore and they're just not even paying newscasters or humans to actually do that. They'll just have automated AI representation of humans and they'll just deliver the news that way. And so they can control the news that way even more. Yeah. I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't know. I haven't watched the news in 15 years, so I couldn't really tell you. Um, I, I suspect there's going to be a, a segment of the population that does go down that, down that rabbit hole. Um, I think that there's going to be a dissection of society that, and I, I don't know if it's going to necessarily be age based, but I definitely think that there's going to be a group, a population that's going to pull, that AI is going to polarize for and against. Um, as with anything, you know, I, I prefer balance. I think that there is good and bad on both sides of the equation for this. You know, I I I, I work with a hospital, um, one of my big clients here, and and they use AI to help doctors diagnose diseases because you know they can it's much faster so and then develop personalized treatment plans using ai and even predict you know because ai can do this in a, in a nanosecond predict some of the patient outcomes based upon some variables so you know there are a lot of positive benefits that that ai can help and again it's it's it, in the name of progress you know humans have always done this just let's just go back you know 60 years to automobiles you know look at what we're driving today. We've got electric cars and we have got cars that can levitate. And now we have, I've seen there are cars that can fly that they're testing. Like, you know, we didn't have those technologies and, you know, there were people back then that were probably saying, you know, well, we can't go that way. There's no way we can do this. It's going to cause this problem. It's going to cause that problem. We're going to have over traffic, whatever it is. But for whatever reason, humans are innovative and they always figure out a way to make things work. We're very efficient people, right? We're very productive people. So um, I suspect that, there, there, there's going to be a polarization of this. The naysayers who say, stay away from it. I'm never going to touch it. And there's going to be people who embrace it wholeheartedly. And like anything, you know, you can use it for corruption and evil, or you can use it for good. And, and, you know, like the hospital is for good and, and productivity and helping people. So, um, I suspect with, in the case of your newscasters, there is probably going to be an AI only, you know, just like ESPN is just sports only. There might be an AI only news channel that just does AI. And, you know, if people want to watch it, they want to watch it. But, um, I still go back to the original statement. 
as with anything, you know, overuse, overabundance, if you have a a 100% proclivity to only use one thing, you're going to be out of balance. And, you know, that's going to that's going to be where the damage and the dangers are going to going to start to, to creep in. So it's interesting to talk about the groups because I'm I even see kind of the groups going like the AI enthusiasts, the middle ones, the hybrids, the ones that embrace it, but have a skepticism towards it. And then the ones that fully reject it and be like, this is a degradation to humankind or whatever. They embrace Terminator two and all those like AI is going to kill us all type of a thing. So are we going to see that with content creators, like in groups too, like the ones that say, I use AI, everything pay me to use for me to use AI to do this or the content creators will do it themselves to do it. And then they don't have to do anything except maybe look good in the camera. And even that maybe not even do that anymore. Are we going to see like the hybrid content creators? Like I'm going to do this, but I'm still going to be part of the process because I feel like learning the process is good. Are we going to have just the manual only? They may even go back to film if they want to. I mean, I don't think you can buy too many film cameras anymore, but we're going to see more of that. Like the groups kind of dividing themselves in that type of a thing where it's like different types of content creators want to do different things. And then we'll kind of see how, I guess people respond in a way, the audience. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, we already have that. So especially in the photography and, and cinema world, we already have people who have don't have the skills, don't have the knowledge, don't, have not put in the time to become a professional master photographer. Let's just use that as, as an example, you know, becoming a master photographer requires years of experience. Um, you have to do an apprenticeship. You have to take a, 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 a copious amount of tests and different things. Um, and you, you need to be, able, you need to be able to pass specific standards that are put in place by like organizations like the PPA, for example. Um, but that's not a that's not a law that's not a protocol that's required so anybody can go over to uh, anywhere amazon best buy wherever you want and buy a really expensive camera and call themselves a photographer and they're going out and they're selling that to people right now and and while they may get some good photos they're not going to take photos like a master photographer would that takes all the variables of photography into consideration which is you know composition and lighting and and angles and context and being able to tell the story of an image by just being part Part of the process. And so there's always going to be a need for that sort of a person. I don't know that AI will ever be able to be sentient enough where they can sit with you through a photo session for, you know, and, and be able to tell your story organically um, just using AI synthetic technologies. There's always going to be a need, in my opinion, for, for people um, that are still going to have to go the traditional route. But those polarizations already exist today. There are people out there today that are selling their photography quote unquote skills to to an audience who isn't necessarily as well, I don't know what the correct word to say this um, without being undiplomatic, but you know, there are some people who just don't really give a shit. Like, I just want a quick photo. Let me get it done. But there are other people like my types of clients who are not looking for the run and gun experience. They're looking for something else that is curated, that is thoughtful, that has critical elements of decision-making in them that tells a story about their product. And so, um, there, there already are two camps. And so I, I only suspect that those camps will probably continue down that channel of their own, div- of their own sort of, um, divestitures. But for people like myself, and I'm putting myself in that camp because i am a master photographer um there's always going to be an audience that wants our services at least given the current paradigm that we operate in does that that make sense yeah that does i mean almost my follow-up question is that like twitter did with their own badges should there almost be like a badge for like people like look i actually don't or i use very little ai and then badge for people saying i use all ai type of thing because not the normal person's not going to know how much you use ai or not. I mean, I will be, I'll always be upfront and say I use it to a certain extent, but I'm still in the process. I still do the video editing. I still go through everything and make sure it sounds good and everything. But there's going to be some people who be like, look at, I just let it do it itself. I kind of sort of check it, but not really. I just kind of say up oh, the, yeah, I did it. So it's done. So it's almost like there needs to be some type of like, I guess, certification in a way, I guess is the best way of saying it to say like, I'm, a per, I'm a content creator that knows how to video edit instead of I'm a content creator that just uses AI to do it for me. Yeah. I mean, it's a good, it's a great question. It's a good idea. I, I don't know that we'll see that anytime soon. I, I think, I think the question we should probably reframe that a little bit is, is, you know, will people be able to tell the difference from it? And if they, if they can't tell the difference of it, does it matter? 
So it goes back to, from my perspective, a moral decision from the creator's perspective. How much am I willing to share with you that I'm doing and how much am I willing to actually use that service? And, and I think, I think from, from my perspective, because I don't use it for any sort of content creation right now, AI, um, you, you know, I, it's, I don't have a AI camera or anything like that, but, um, I do manually edit all my images. I do manually edit all of my videography, all those things. Um, but probably, probably advertising your services and letting people know sort of what level of curation you're taking at this would probably be the better, better way to, to approach that just so that the in buyer, the consumer sort of knows. And especially if they're discerning enough that they can tell the difference, this is what I'm paying for. So they sort of know upfront what they're getting out of, out of their dollar that they're spending. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. It's almost like for me, it would be like asking yourself a question. Okay. What's if I did all AI didn't tell the customer and then they found out that I wasn't even part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. Would they be actually upset with me? Would they be yeah. like, I want my money back or some type of legal action if there is actually ever any loss to do anything, but something negative towards you, would they be upset with it? Yeah, I think, um, I think I did. I, I would probably want to understand the implications of that a little bit better. Um, is AI recreating something that's already been created through plagiarism? So for me, that would go back to that moral situation again, that conscientious decision on, am I recreating, am I, am I creating something using AI that's of my original native work or am I bastardizing and creating something else that someone already did? And, you know, from, from a standpoint of content creation, it's not like, it's not like everything isn't recreated anyway. Like people copy my photos all the time. I see versions of what I've already done uh, and, you know, local photographers, but I've done the same thing. Like that's what I, you know, I'll find a really cool photograph on Pinterest and I'll say, Hey, I'm going to sort of recreate this in my own unique way. So I guess for me, it would just sort of have to be, it, it, what's the implications of the recreation is, is, is it truly, um, is, is the plagiarism causing a moral and conscious decision by like, you know, if I'm going to write a book, for example, with using AI, am I going to recreate word for word Dostoevsky or, you know, Jody Picoult or any of these p books back here? And, you know, Michael McAllowitz, I'm reading right now, Profit First and, you know, how, you know, how to make more money with your money. And am I going to write my own book? And it's basically written by AI and it just literally is a plagiarism of that. Now, that obviously is a moral decision that there's going to be some problems and some fallout from that. But um, from a content creation perspective, you know, creating photos, creating video, I guess I would just need to understand the implications and sort of, you know, how far does it actually go? Yeah. I mean, we could put it into two different groups. There's inspiration, which what you would do. And there's plagiarism. Inspiration is like, I like that. I want to see if I can do something, but give it a twist, but I'm inspired by what someone else is doing to try it myself where I'm still making it a little different, but it's still s some type of inspiration. And then a complete copy where it's like, well, I can't tell the difference between this one and this one because yeah. it's a complete copy. Absolutely. But well, it's kind of interesting. We should probably, you know, we could take this conversation in a bunch of different directions. You know, there's not much original work anymore, period, in anything. Like, you know, you go on Instagram and you have all these gurus talking about spirituality and holistic and you have dietitians talking about how to do this and you've got people talking about how to do this. And those, most of these people are just recreating something that they've already learned themselves and now they're just putting their own personal spin on it. So again, it goes back to that moral compass. What's the implication of my creation? And, and I would need to understand that a little bit better. Am I taking something word for word and writing a book with AI? Am I taking an image and literally recreating the – am I saying, hey, I take a look at this photo, scan it in, and I want you to recreate this exact same image. I'm going to give that to my client and then pass it off as my original work. You know, That's obviously a moral and conscientious issue that's immoral. And so, again, I would need to understand the implications of what that recreation looks like because, truthfully speaking, there is not a lot of original work. Most everyone is just repeating, rephrasing, regurgitating something that they learned from someone else. Like it's, that's just the nature of – that's just the nature of human and, and history in of itself, right? Everything's in a cycle. So like media, television, cartoons, like everything is just a recreation of something. I, my daughters are wearing Nike Air Flights and Air Jordans again and like that I wore when I was in middle school and high school. Like they're literally the exact same shoes. They just recreated them and added a couple extra hundred dollars to them. Yeah, I mean, 
one of the books in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, basically said there's nothing new under the sun. And I've always been like, that's basically pretty true. I mean, we think it's something new. And then you go back in history, it's like, it's actually not very new. So I'm going to try to do that. Yeah. Dude, first of all, you're the first person in like five years that's dropped some Ecclesiastes on a podcast. So well done. <laughs> I know my Bible to a certain extent and I knew, and it's also one of my favorite books actually, because it's more philosophical in a way and it doesn't uh-huh. really give you answers. It just kind of goes, this is life. This is what happens. Deal with it. Now there's a conversation we could have the Bible. Cause I think it's all just a metaphor. I'm sort of, sounds like what I hear you saying. Um, and I'm actually very much into the Bible as well. So it's interesting. I'm reading the book of Enoch right now, just so I can sort of understand from a different context, because, you know, the book of Enoch was removed from the the canonical Bible that we now have in, you know, written print for everyone. So, but anyway, we're getting off topic, but that's a great conversation we should have one day. Yeah. And then, I mean, back to content creators, how should we respond to AI? I mean, we've kind of talked about it. It seems like for a lot of us, we're going to respond to, we're going to use it for a lot of them, I should say, not everyone, because there's always different groups. But we're, but for the kind of the people that have already done content creation for a while, it feels like we're going to use it, but we're going to use it wisely or in ways that helps us with our workflow, but not fully trust it or fully use it to us stepping back and not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need, I think there needs to be a broader discussion on the role of humans in ensuring that the ethical and responsible use of AI is implemented. And, and, and that's on a, on a user, user by user basis and probably by a, a group by group basis. Um, I, I think there needs to be some human oversight in all of this because, you know, as we've discussed throughout the conversation, if, if, if there isn't, it's not only going to be training us to not use our own critical processes and our own critical thinking, but if AI were to go, Un, if, 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 if AI potentially, given the, the, the gaps that it's already closed in just the, sh- the few short years that it's been in the mainstream, if it were to continue in that capacity, unfettered, unchecked, like who knows where it could go? So um, I, I do think that there needs to be some standards put in place, absolutely, on, a, on both a personal and a global level. And, and I don't know what those look like. That's way outside my pay grade. But um, I, I would suspect that we we each as individuals need to sort of understand what what this game looks like that we're playing understand the implications of it and then come up with our own set of morals and parameters on how we're going to use it safely and responsibly Hmm. it almost needs to be like a almost like a content creation loosely federation basically being like this is how we're going to use ai and like i mean there could be different types of groups but i'm just saying this is how we use ai this is how we tell our customers because i feel like if we don't really message or market the right way, the customer is going to be pissed off and be like, I could have just done chat GPT without you and not paid all this money because you did exactly what I could have done myself. Yeah, but they didn't do it themselves. So there's, there's always going to be those people like, you know, I don't mow my own yard or clean up my yard every week anymore. I used to do that all, all, all my life. I've taken care of my yard, but I'm at a point now where I have bigger and better things to do from my own personal priority list. Right. So there's always going to be people who are, are going to do that themselves. There's always going to be the DI, DIY world. Um, but there's always going to be the people that have moved beyond that space and are going to want someone to do it for them. So from a, from an ethical standpoint, I, you know, however the job gets done, as long as there's no harm being done, as there's and there's not being you know elite, something being recreated illegally or plagiarized or whatever, you know, I think that people just I can I feel like a broken record. I, I think it's just going to have to be done on a personal individual basis so that people are able to monitor what they're doing without completely completely giving away the keys to the kingdom on everything. So fun question for you. What AI would you like to be created to help you with your workflow even more? Uh, that's a good question. Is there one on parenting? I have two teenage daughters, man. I, I need some parenting AI right now. I have two daughters who are completely different from each other. And one of them just sort of toes the line and does her own thing. And, and you know, never really gets in trouble. And the other one pushes the bubble on everything. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing because, you know, the people who push the bubble are the people who are, you know, the change makers in the world. So, but dealing with that as a parent is sometimes, I don't know if you have kids, but dealing with change makers as your own children, it can be a monumental task. So give me some AI parenting. Um, outside of the joke world, I think, 
really the truthfully the post production of things. I think, um, especially with my podcast, I, I find um, there's a lot of tedium. Uh, duplicitous things that go on from creating show notes to time stamping it to, you know, putting all of the different segments together to creating shorts from it, you know, being able to take, it'd be nice to be able to produce my own content like I do, and then edit that content down like I do manually right now. But it'd be really cool that once I got the the cream, if you will, the cream of the crop of the show that then I could dump it into a, a program that's only going to take the cream of the crop and then redistribute it, make the shorts, do the show notes, whatever it is, because then I would know that it's only editing the stuff that I've already created myself. Does that make sense? So that would be a nice tool for me. It's always the post-production. It's always the longest part and the most tedium part about everything because you always have to edit the show to a certain extent. I mean, it depends on the person. If you wanted to always get rid of the ums and uhs, I'm more of a, if it's oak, if it's not a obsessive, let's just say that if it's not saying every other word, ums and uhs, I leave it mm -hmm. in. But if it's like too much, I'm like, well, I have to take most of this out now. So I get what you're saying because it, it can, a lot of it can become tedious. Yeah, you know, I, I do a, we're talking about content creation. So I just finished a shoot yesterday um, with one of my clients and there's like 2,500, 3,500 images in there. So um, I know that there are AI tools like Adobe already has one out there where they'll go through and cull all of your images for you. And I've played with it, but it doesn't do the job that I need done. It, there's a lot of error in it, um, a lot of um, omission of, of key images that should have been there. But it's supposed to sort of look for dupl duplicates and closed eyes and bad lighting and things that just don't really fit. But um, that would be a nice tool to be able to have, to be honest with you, because going through a first pass of images for me, Getting that twenty five hundred down to you know a couple hundred images that I'm actually going to eventually use for something would be a nice tool. And I don't, I haven't seen the technology there yet. And it, it, if it exists, I don't know about it. But uh, that would be another usage for me. I got a really cool book for you if you'd like to read on AI. That I, because I started down this. Um, it's it, it, the timing of your uh, request to be on the show is interesting because and the topic because I've I've been exploring this now for about six months and I, and I've read some really cool books on it. Um, the one I really liked the most was called The Singularity is Near. When um, It's sort of like when humans transcend biology. And I can't remember the name of the author, but I believe his last name was Kurzweil. I think Ray Kurzweil was his name. A really good book, but it, it explores the potential implications of exponential growth of this AI technology and, and the possibility of like technological singularity and, and, you know, where machines become smarter than humans. So it's a really good book. Um, if, if anyone's looking to explore, if you're looking for a good read on the impact of AI, this was a, a phenomenal read for me. And it's really sort of helped me shape some of the beliefs that I have around this, which is, you know, like there's a moral compass that has to be employed across the line on this on an individual level. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like an interesting read. I'll put it on my list of very, a very long list of things to read. <laughs> you, need an, you need an AI bot to read it for you. Uh, yeah, but th then I just don't learn it because the AI bot learns it. And then I'm just like, well, that didn't learn anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm but, an old school book reader, as you can see behind me. I, I, I don't even listen to um, audibles. I, I just like to read a book. I don't either. I, I, I do my own book reading, too, because... Mm -hmm. I know you can get through books a lot faster with it, but I don't feel like you learn it as well as if you actually read it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I absolutely. 100% agree. And I like to, I like to make notes in my books and stuff and go back and reference them and research stuff. So yeah, I can't do that with audible. Well, I guess you probably well, you, could, but it's not the same thing. Agreed. And so where can people find you online? Instagram is probably my biggest um, area of playing in the digital sandbox. It's Fusion Photog, short for photography. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, my website is Fusion Creative Branding and Fusion Photography Studio. Those are the two websites. All right. Any final thoughts for the listeners? Hmm. Um, thanks for having me on the show. I think AI has the potential to revolutionize the way that we work. I really do. Um, but as I think Joe, uh, Master Yoda said, as with great power comes great responsibility. So, you know, it, it's the onus is on us as individuals to live our lives critically and profoundly and to do the things that are responsible 
responsible and accountable to be good humans. And AI falls into that bucket. And if we're going to take a tool and bastardize it and make it um, make it a tool for pernicious output, if you will, then you, you're not you're not following in the line of of good karma. And so, um, not to get weird and holistic and woo woo on you, but like anything, find a balance. And, and use it for the things that are not going to disrupt the status quo too much or disrupt the moral status quo of things and, and, find, and, and be able to have some moral obligation around how you use it and, and, and drawing a line in the sand on things you're not going to do with AI. And I, I feel like it could, it could be a really productive tool and really help you out in a lot of different ways. Agree. But thanks, Devo, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on content creation and just AI. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, man. And thank you for joining. As always, please subscribe to the podcast on all your favorite podcasts and apps with a five-star review. And join us, join me next month as we talk to another great lot here in the PR marketing industry. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding how you can use AI to help your workflow. And see you next month. Later.